I think Jackie instinctively knew what an audience wanted, and, and he gave it to them and um, made sure that we did too. It was exciting. It was happening here, and, and we could get work. The work wasn't so plentiful, perhaps, on stage, except for summer stock, perhaps, and, and uh, all of a sudden things were happening in New York, and it was very exciting. I guess just from doing a, a, a lot of the half-hour shows, and a press agent friend of mine said, oh, I can get you some publicity. Uh, we'll, we'll just say you were murdered a million times, and so we exaggerated a bit, and then I did have some nice publicity about being murdered a lot on television. So that was fun. You're on a sound stage, and you're not on a regular presidium stage, and the little sets are built in various places, and you run from one to another, and uh, lots of times you have to change clothes, <laughs> just there, somewhere behind the set, and you just can't care who, who's watching. And um, it was really very nerve-wracking, and, and, but exciting, and, and um, you, you just had to realize that, that this was live and it was happening and you weren't going to be able to do it over. And uh, you just loved it anyway. I can't ever remember anything terrible going wrong, but um, you would just uh, try to ad lib in character. That was something Jackie Gleason always said. If something goes wrong, ad lib in character. So I think we knew how to do that uh, even before I met him. Well, I'm. I'm older and settled, and, and I guess I, I wouldn't want that much excitement. <laughs> it was uh, very nerve-wracking with Mr. Gleason because he didn't like to rehearse much at all. I had done uh, Claret's commercials for them on both Cavalcade of Stars and Cavalcade of Bands. Cause they had the two shows on um, Fox 5 in those days. And then uh, Joe Cates was the casting guy for both shows, and he called up and, and said, um, uh, have you seen The Honeymooners? And I said, no. He said, well, but we have Jackie Gleason, and he's very talented, and with the writers, he's written a skit. And uh, the writers are going to interview girls. Now try to look older and come in and read, and I did that. I tried to look older. I came in, I read, and, and um, um, I'm trying to think of the head writer's name. He was quite popular. He hired me, and I did this serious skit with Jackie in front of a live audience. We had rehearsed it once. And it was about uh, a vaudevillian. He's a vaudevillian. He comes back to this tank town, perhaps where he grew up, and talks to this woman in his dressing room. And we just, I can't remember the dialogue anymore, but uh, it wasn't funny at all. It just kind of sat there. The audience didn't know what to think. But he must have liked it, because a few weeks later, Joe Cates is on the phone again. And he said, have you seen uh, a thing we've been doing called The Honeymooners? And I said, no, Diana and I, my room, we don't even have a television set. He said, well, Jackie Gleason is the bus driver, and Pert Kelton is his wife, and Art Carney's been playing the sewer worker. And now they've written in a wife for the sewer worker, called Trixie. And Mr. Gleason said to me, get me that serious actress. So he didn't even know my name or anything, but I guess he felt that I looked right enough and, or could do it. And I started doing fell, fell in with that way without an agent, which is not a good idea. <laughs> but uh, you didn't care in those days. It was so much fun to be working. Yes, it was because of the blacklisting, and CBS said that she wasn't going to be on their, on their network. So Jackie had to find someone else, and, and he found Audrey. I don't know. They say that, that actors and actresses join crazy groups, and, and they weren't quite sure what, what they were joining, and it certainly didn't seem uh, communistic or, or anything, and, and later they found out it was. and, and my gosh, then they were blacklisted, and it was, it was a terrible time, really. I was so glad I had never joined anything. <laughs> he wanted to get things done quickly. He did, didn't like to, you know, hash it over, mull it over, uh, work on it. He, he felt that when you did it spontaneously, it was very right and very funny, and I, I, I think he was correct. You know, it worked. But his... Uh, well, charisma, what, with Art Carney. I mean, the, the, the two were just magic together. I, I don't think that Jackie would have um, been that great without Art. I don't know, maybe it was the Irishness or, or, or something. They, they just worked so well together. Uh, they could ad-lib if they had to, and, you know, write in character. And, and 
Art was just so funny, and, and um, Jackie wanted Art to be funny. I don't think he wasn't jealous. He, he knew that it, it was working. You know, it was so quick because we hadn't rehearsed that, that um, you didn't think. You just were trying to play in the moment, and but sometimes you're looking ahead for your lines. But um, you just, I don't know, it, it, uh, it was strange. It was, um, it was scary. But well, we did rehearse a little bit more than just with Mr. Gleason on, that, on each Saturday. We would all troop up to Audrey's dressing room and her manager would read in Jackie's lines so we could go over and over the words, which, which really helped. And then when would you meet Jackie for the first time and, and go over with him? On stage, CBS Studio 50, which is now the Ed Sullivan Theater on Broadway and 52nd. So you'd do one rehearsal with Jackie or two? or Just one. What if some that? little thing went wrong, he might go over some bit, but really just once. We just knew he wanted it spontaneous and fast and live and, and true, and, and um, he felt that you didn't get those things if you had been doing it over and over and over. It just, just wasn't fresh enough for him. And, and I, maybe he was inspired when, when he was nervous, and, and um, I think perhaps we all were. <laughs> Well, so you think he was a little bit nervous when he came out there? Uh, maybe not nervous. I mean, he had a tremendous ego. <laughs> he was wonderful. But, uh, yeah, it, it could be a, a little exciting. You know, you're, you're live and you haven't done this much, you know. It's Tuesday night and Friday night. Because we were a half-hour show just with, well, for ourselves. We were not part of the one-hour show anymore. So just one year, when Buick was our sponsor, we did 39 uh, for that season. And, and did the quality suffer because you were doing so, them so rapidly, do you think? I don't think so. People love those 39. They call them the classic 39. <laughs> they do. He didn't seem to want to do another season with two a week. I think that was a little hard on him. You know, it was. And he said the scripts, uh, he couldn't get really good scripts anymore. So we just did one more year with a full hour show and the dancers and everybody, you know. Now, the reason you were doing two a week was, wasn't it because he wanted to do other things? Was he maybe trying to do two a week? I guess that he wanted a, a, a good long hiatus and then come back and, and do uh, more of the 39. We had, we had a big break. We worked a couple of months and there was a big break. We worked a couple more months. Maybe he made a film, I don't know, or maybe he just took it easy, you know. He ran everything, everything. He, he picked the costumes, of, you know, he just, everyone deferred to him for every, every question. It was amazing. So, he, and he seemed to be right most of the time. <laughs> Instinctively, he knew what was right, even though he wasn't a well-schooled man, but theatrically he knew. He didn't seem to be a stand-up comic. That was not his forte. He was a sketch man and, and um, he became famous doing his sketches, and particularly uh, Ralph Cramden. He didn't give a lot of advice except to, uh, if something goes wrong, ad lib in character. That, that's about all he would say. He, he, didn't, um, he didn't direct us, really. We had a director and a producer. and, and um, but sometimes he'd get on them off to the side and maybe tell them something, and they would tell us, perhaps. But there wasn't a lot of that. It, it had to be done so quickly in one day. Ah, uh, yes, yes, he was kind, and, and um, he was mercurial. You never knew how he would be on a Saturday morning. Sometimes he could be, you know, black Irish, morose, unhappy. And other times he was happy and, and um, wonderful. You, you just never knew how he'd be. He was changeable. And you sort of had to kind of react to whatever he was doing that day. Yes. <laughs> well, there weren't too many outbursts. You know, he was kind to actors, and particularly to actresses, I think. And, and uh, he was kind to everybody. Uh, well, I guess I heard him yell a few times, but um, not at honeymooners people. Jackie was egotistical, yes, I think he was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't do what he did and not be egotistical, you know. Jackie did have a big personality, and um, if he was in one of his expansive moods, you really knew he was there. But sometimes, you know, he could be in, in a black Irish mood, and, and um, as I said, he was changeable. You know, he was all business on Saturday. 
but I, I guess that at uh, Twitch Shores restaurant and bar, he, he um, could be the life of the party. And uh, he and Toots were, were very close. Well, uh, he had a director and a producer, and, and uh, they did their jobs, but um, yeah, he, he did a lot of it, or he would say something. And um, as I said, everyone deferred to him. <laughs> well, sometimes you would go to the producer. Um, the director was always back in the booth, so it was a uh, it was a different sort of set, I gather, than uh, well, Sid Caesar's people worked what six days a week, or five, five or six days a week, and, and long hours. And gee, we we didn't. Once I was crossing Fifty Seventh Street. This was maybe the show had been on just a couple of years, and across the way I saw um, Mr. Reiner and Howie Morris coming across the street, and I kind of looked at them, and they gave me a big smile, and I thought, oh my God, they know who I am. I couldn't believe it. I was, I was so thrilled. Sid Caesar. Well, Perry Como, that was, you know, music. Were there any other comics working when we were? I don't think so. It was, it was already happening on the West Coast. Luce, Lucille Ball was out on the West Coast. Started just when we did. Everyone on it was so talented, and um, it just was funny. I mean, they were funny people, and they, they knew what they were doing. They had been rehearsed, you know. <laughs> they weren't flying by the seat of their pants, you know. <laughs> He's the sweetest guy in the world. He was just wonderful. Very little camaraderie because you, you're with them just this one day, and maybe a little bit on Friday, so you, you don't go to lunch with them. You don't get to know them. That, I was unhappy about that, but that's the way it was, you know. And Art, Art was a, um, um, a quiet man. He, he wasn't, um, you know, one to say, hey, let's go to lunch or something. He wasn't that type. They could be mean. Yeah. I mean, when you ask for more money, you see, it's so terrible to be there without an agent, you know. And if you'd ask for a little more money, they'd say, well, we'll get another girl. And you say, oh, my God. Would Later you realize they wouldn't have gotten another girl, but you get scared because they, they were mean, some of his uh, henchmen. <laughs> Joe the bartender and, and um, well, uh, Reginald Van Gleeson III, yes, I think he loved to be grand that way. And, and um, what else did we have? Rudy the repairman, not so much that, but that was funny. The poor soul. The poor soul. Um, I suppose there was some of that in him because he could play it so well. Jackie is every man, and... So it just appeals to people, you know, they, they can identify, people can identify with us. So many people come up to me and say, oh, my dad was just like Jackie. <laughs> I've heard that many times, that their dad was just like Jackie. And cab drivers have said to me that they learned English by watching our show. Well, that always amazes me, would say people learn English by watching our show, learn to speak, can you imagine? But I've heard that many times. Um, I guess it did fit into America at that time, although it was set in Brooklyn, and, and uh, people in the Midwest don't really identify with Brooklyn, yet they somehow identified with the people on it, with, with us. And it worked. Um, so I guess that it did, uh, it was the, at the right time in, in, in America. But you know, it was a bit of a takeoff on the Honeymooners, a little bit of a takeoff. And uh, the one that's been so popular now, uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, that definitely was. They say so. Um, the producer and the director there have told me that uh, they, they, they hugged and kissed me and said, because of you guys, we're here. So, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, Ray Romano is often doing the wrong thing and his wife yells at him. And they don't have a couple, but they have the mother and dad right there. So that's the other couple. So uh, they admitted that it was a takeoff. Well, anyone in, in which I got to say more than five or six lines and could stay on for a little while, that became a favorite. <laughs> Did you feel like your Now, what was your character's history? She was in burlesque a little bit. Well, they implied twice that she had been in burlesque. <laughs> but I don't know, you know, if that was supposed to be true. They didn't follow up on it, thank goodness. You, how did you play Trixie? As someone who was a little bit maybe better than her situation in life? Yes, well, I think both Audrey and I did. We were, we were better than our husbands, you know, and, and, which seemed to work. 
And uh, the very first season, when we were still on Fox 5, and I was working with Pert Kelton, uh, Pert had a marvelous Brooklyn accent. I think it sort of came natural to her. <laughs> she probably uh, emphasized it for the show. So I figured, well, I guess I have to talk like that. So I've you know, seen a few of those old ones at the Museum of Television and Radio, and I said, my goodness, why am I talking like that? <laughs> I, I don't have to. But then when I was playing uh, opposite Audrey, uh, Audrey just talked in her own natural accent, kind of uh, Connecticut style. And I said, well, I can just speak Detroit style. I don't have to be from Brooklyn now. <laughs> so it changed. And did Mr. Gleason have any input on the, your accents? I don't think he even noticed. <laughs> Oh, well, people would send in curtains and drapes for the windows, and Jackie would give them to um, hospitals, I guess, because there aren't going to be any curtains on our windows. And, and why did he want that set the way that it was? Well, I was told that he grew up in a very poor home in Brooklyn, and that maybe it looked something like that. You know, that I, I was told that, and, and I know that uh, they were poor people. I think the, the elder Mr. Gleason had absconded. And Jackie's hardworking mother brought him up. And I think that perhaps, the, you know, the apartment wasn't, wasn't very good. Knowing how talented he was and how much he wanted to do straight acting, and he was so good at it, I, I always figured he'd be around. Mm -hmm. well, so that's interesting. He, wanted to, he really wanted to, the Huntingwooders, was this his sidelight? He really wanted to be a straight actor? I think he just, he really wanted to be a big stage star. But except he didn't like to do that. He did, uh, what was it, Take Me Along on Broadway? And I think he got very bored with uh, doing the same thing every night. Well, you forgot them. We, we were on a, a regular stage. You know, that had been an old vaudeville house. So you felt you were on stage and you, we just projected out to the audience. We didn't worry about any. We were not bodily mic'd. The mics were up over our heads and we projected. And um, now I forgot what. <laughs> I'm the cameras were they in the way? Uh, not, not too much. But that was for what years, 90, 1952, 53, 54. The season of 55, 56 is when we used the Dumont electronic cam system, and we're the only ones who use that system. And that was to do the 39 half hours. And with that system, there were three cameras on stage. And um, there was film in them, which ran out at 15 minutes. So at 15 minutes, there was a break, and they were reloaded. And, but they did it very quickly, you hardly noticed. I, mean, I, I didn't re re even realize it at the time, I think, but, but uh, that's what it was with the Dumont electronic cam system. And that's a very good system. It's, it looks like film, yet we worked live and right through, no stopping, except for the, the, to fill the, the, to refill the cameras. So that's, what, that's why it's preserved so well. Yes, that's why the 39 looks so good. They yeah, have that Dumont electronic cam system. And I'm not that big a celebrity. It, it, it's, uh, it's gotten to be more lately. It wasn't so much then. It's in, it's in these later years that people say, oh, God, let me hug you. You're an icon. I mean, really? <laughs> well, it was an iconic show, and you were an important part of it. And we have our caricatures over the bar at Sardis. We're the only ones over the bar, the four of us. <laughs> you know? A couple of those specials I should have been on, and some uh, writers went to Jackie, uh, reporters, and said, why wasn't I there? And he said that um, we had a very strange answer, that at ABC, which was doing it, um, Jackie said he just accepted the list of people that were available to do it <clears throat> and didn't know where I was. Well, I was right in Manhattan, but... <laughs> um, it, it was strange. It really was a little strange. I, I should have been on one or two of them, yes. He was um, very friendly with Jane Keene, who did play Trixie in the uh, Color Honeymooners, the musical Honeymooners. So we, uh, being a, a close personal friend of hers, he just kind of threw her into the specials. We were never, Jackie and I were never that close. But Jane and her sister had helped him very early on in his career, and I think he always remembered it. Um, he wasn't working, and Jane and her sister were at a, a summer stock company, I think, in Rhode Island, 
And it was this Amish stock company that had um, a little cafe and stage connected with it for, for nightclub shows. And they were going to do uh, the, the comedy called The Show Off, which in the movies you've all seen Joey Brown play this in the movies. Well, it's from a play. And they had told the directors of, of this summer stock company, oh, we know just the guy to do the show off and he can do the, the cabaret afterwards. So he had this job for a number of weeks and I think he was always devoted to the Keen sisters. Well, we were pioneers simply because we were one of the first. I, I don't think we started anything so new. Um, Jackie's characters were his own and were very good. And uh, I guess we were the first ones to be a Brooklyn family, so we were innovators in that way, pioneers. And, um, well, pioneers, and we didn't rehearse, but nobody else followed that. Everybody else wanted to rehearse. And um, now people just say we're pioneers, so I accept that. That's fine. We knew this was something new and wonderful, and, and here we are, we're participants. Never knew this would happen, and, and it's wonderful, yes. I think Jackie instinctively knew what an audience wanted, and, and he gave it to them, and um, made sure that we did too. And, and he was very tough on the writers. He would uh, hire them and fire them if, if he didn't like their output. It's a great legacy to have, and, and I'm proud of it and happy with it, and, and um, you know, it, it's fun. Uh, some years back, when my son was going to Yale, he came home one vacation time and said, he said, gee, guys come up to me and say, is your mother really Trixie? And I guess that was the first time it dawned on him that maybe it was something special. I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I, we realized it was going to be big, I think. I think we knew that. But you always hope to get back on stage. I, I did some uh, summer stock after, after the honeymooners. Oh, Milton's a wonderful guy. Um, he was always fun and nice and good to work with. And, and, um, and then in that brief time that I was living in Hollywood, I did go to dinner with Milton Berle, his, his then wife, Joyce Matthews, and um, a fellow that I was dating who knew Milton, and, and we went to a, I know, a lovely restaurant on the Sunset Strip. And he remembered that I'd worked with him, and he was very nice. Well, the, the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were just crazy on the set, you know, they just fooling around. And, and um, the, the skit I did was with Jerry Lewis, and it was something with a baby buggy. And he, he turned out to be the baby in the buggy that I was pushing. It was Jerry Lewis. And that's about as much of it as I can remember. But they, they were crazy guys, you know, really. Hmm. It's in Louisville, Kentucky, in the big open-air amphitheater there. And it was Audrey Meadows opposite Jean Berry. So I worked with Audrey before I worked with her on television. And um, Gene was wonderful. And, and uh, last year or year before, he was here in the Oak Room at the Algonquin singing. And uh, of course, I went to see him, and, and he was just as charming as ever. Very briefly, when there was a memorial for Jackie after his passing, and, and this big um, hotel grand ballroom, I forget which one it was, I met her very briefly. What was your take on Lucy at the time and, and uh, her... Uh... Oh, she's a fantastically talented woman and, and I guess very smart business-wise. Although, although they said Desi was, uh, was pretty smart too, it wasn't all Lucy. And uh, mm -hmm. at this memorial, I didn't think her words were kind enough about Jackie. She's a little bit sharp. Uh, I don't know why, you know. It, it surprised a few of us that, that she, she didn't come across sweeter at this memorial. But that never went out on television or anything, that, that memorial. I don't think it did. Well, so it didn't, for, for didn't Lucy, matter. 